an enterprise database. So if you open this up, what do you see? Well, it's supposed to see a very ugly relational schema, right? <laughs> thousands of tables, tens of thousands of an attributes. So you have too many tables and too many attributes. It's impossible to understand the names. So this is, a, if you, this is an e-commerce database. You have, you're talking about orders. There's not one table called orders. There's probably 10 or 15. Uh, complex relationships. People just want to know, I want to know the orders and the customers and the products. Very simple relationships. That involves a very complicated SQL query with a bunch of joins. Uh, the data elements do not correspond to the way the business people think about things, right? Uh, even if you're, like, you're an SAP, the names are in German then. Uh, the data experts are not available. Master data is sometimes off limits. So you get a spreadsheet, a CSV file. Uh, people are starting to use these data prep tools. They're great, but they start generating these silos of quote unquote clean data. And then everybody starts defining what a large order is. Somebody said it was 15 orders. Somebody said it was 20 orders. And we start getting this difference. Um, and then databases have a bunch of quality issues of nulls, of duplicates. How do we fix this stuff? So, what if you could see, again, this doesn't look as beautiful as I want it to be, but if you could just visualize your data and this very beautiful way of how the business users think about it, which is what we draw on the whiteboard, bubbles and lines between them. And that really is what we're calling the knowledge graph. It's just this way of modeling data as a graph, and we want to be able to connect this to that inscrutable data sources that we have. And that's what I'm going to be talking about for the next 18 minutes here. How do we do this in the real world? So, who are we? Capcent is a spin up from the University of Texas at Austin. That's where I did my PhD. And I've been over for a decade trying to understand the relationship between relational databases and semantic web graph technologies, understand how do we put these two things together. And what we've developed is our, our mapping technology, our, our, our real time virtualization, semantic data virtualization technology, which was spun out into Capcent like five years ago. Uh, so we've been really working on this problem for over a decade. So, in case you have to leave in the next minute, this is what I want you to take away. You got domain experts who want to be able to ask business questions. And they want to generate reports and go get data and do AI, machine learning, whatever. But you have all this bunch of different data sources. And there's this gigantic conceptualization cap. And the question is, or my the question is, how do we bridge this conceptualization gap? Because if we don't, it's garbage in and garbage out, which people have already mentioned. So how do we bridge this conceptualization gap? So as you can imagine, the answer, what I'm answer is, oh, we use a knowledge graph. But the longer answer is that there's three things I want you to take away. We need a knowledge engineer. We need methodologies, and we need tools where we need to understand the relationship between humans and machines in the loop. So now you can leave if you have to leave. But, but knowledge graph is this big thing, and I'm really happy I saw Pierce talk about the history, and I'm a big fan of history. We talk about knowledge and data, and things have been going on for decades and decades. Knowledge graph is a term that Google posted in a marketing blog seven years ago. But the history goes all the way back to semantic networks and network databases. Go figure, graphs back in the, and back in the 60s. And there's been all this bunch of events that have occurred over the last 60 years. Raise your hand if you've ever heard about the Japanese fifth generation project. OK, those who have it, go look at the Wikipedia page. You're going to see that we're kind of reinventing the wheel in the new context and the new systems that we have today. I mean, this is just a quick laundry list of things that are going on. If you're interested, take a look at this knowledge graph dot today. We're organizing a tutorial on the history of knowledge graphs that goes back for 50 years. So we've been also hearing a lot about, right, we ha the goal is to be able to create this knowledge graph and extract the knowledge graph from different data sources. And we have data coming from unstructured all the way to structured. We've been hearing a lot today about the unstructured stuff. Not everybody is a Google, Airbnb in the, uh, in, in the world. And our focus is the structured part. So really, if I start from with just one relational database, understanding one relational database is already a hard problem. So I admire people who are working things on text and stuff. That's a really complicated problem. I want to focus on something that's even, which I think is still simpler to do, but it's still very hard. So we're focusing on the structured part. And if we look at the chasm stuff, we're really very early on. We're still in the innovators phase. And we've been working on this from a research perspective for over 10 years, and now the last four or five years trying to commercialize this. And I said, I carry two hats. I carry my academic scientific hat, but also my engineering business hat on. And I've been looking to this chasm for the last almost a decade. I want to share with you what I've been observing in this chasm. Observation number one, there's a lot of ad hoc things that people are doing. People say, oh, here's a database, and I can just ad hoc write code and generate a graph and stick it in a graph database. OK, what's really in here? Do you, how many times do you like actually, people are thinking, like, what's my schema? 
have no idea. How do, how do I query this? Why is this slow? What if the person who wrote that script got run, by a, got run over by a bus, God forbid? Who's going to maintain that stuff? This happens right now all the time. Then if you go look at the, look at the semantic aware folks, right? People who've been doing the RDF stuff and ontologists and things, you have an ontologist creating, creating an ontology, and then there's a bunch of stuff that occurs <laughs> that traditional IT folks who know SQL databases have no freaking idea what's going on. Who's going to put this in, in, in production? And, 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 and I think the complaint is that you need to hire people with PhDs in semantic web to maintain this. This is not a scalable solution. So observation number three, we're boiling the ocean. People are going on and thinking, we need to go and engineer the ontology of everything. And we're going to spend six months and a million dollars. Typical, typically how you do your enterprise data warehouses, right? You go hire an Accenture, forgive, I know they're here, but you go six months and a million dollars to create an enterprise data warehouse. What? And then you say, there's all these techniques about how to create ontologies. And then we say, well, I've created my ontology. I got my database schemas. Let's go map them. We can use machine learning to put these two things together. That stuff doesn't work in real life. In theory, in the academia, it looks nice because we're matching this one thing to one thing over here. But in reality, in the enterprise complex systems, they don't. Because these database schemas are so hard. How many people in an organization understand these database schemas? Oracle EBS has 25,000 tables, which attributes called segment one, segment two, segment 99. So when you're trying to say that we want to automate these things, it's incredibly hard. Why? Because not even the humans will agree. So let's assume I have this really short schema here. Let's make the big assumption that there's a table called order, and every single instance of that table order represents what a concept order is. And let's assume that there's a table called date and a table called, an attribute called date and currency. These are simple one-to-one -one mappings. OK. But you have to know that uh, four, and five mean, 4 and 5 means inactive, and 1, 2, 3 means active. That's written down somewhere, right? Maybe it's in the database. Maybe it's in our documentation. But in, in, let's talk about the e-commerce space. The concept or the, the attribute of a net sales. Financially, what is a net sales? It's the gross minus the taxes minus the discounts. You're thinking your source database is an attribute called net sales, or something as simple as the gross and the taxes? No, you got to go figure this out. You have to know that in this company, our customer type A always gets a 5% discount, and the shipping costs in Canada and the US always have taxes and other. You got to put this in. So I was, the Capital One folks were talking about the mappings. This is our day to day. I have no idea how we're ever going to automate this stuff. And what we really need to do is to have methodologies we'll talk about in a second. How are we going to do with nulls and duplicates? Sometimes you see that there's nulls. Oh, the, the null means one. But there's a one value, too. Why is there a null? I don't know. It's just the way the system was designed. So if you don't make those changes and you do some aggregation, then you're missing a bunch of data. Or why, for some reason, does a customer have multiple birth dates? It's, and, and the relational database is consistent with respect to its constraints. This is how things were modeled, right? Social problem. Knowledge hoarding. The capital one ladies were saying this morning, people don't want to share their knowledge, right? People have, their knowledge is power, control, job security, and makes them feel very important. Everybody comes to them, right? And you come in and you say, ah, oh, we're going to democratize or humanize your data. Well, they feel threatened. So how do we overcome this? And uh, how do we create the schemas? I know graphs are all about, oh, schema last, we can go do this quickly. But once you get into getting into enterprise data, you realize that we need schemas. And there are no good graph modeling schema tools out there. So how do we bridge this chasm? Two aspects. The social one is what I'm calling the knowledge engineer. And we need methodologies. And from a technical point of view, we need modeling and mapping tools. And there is this balance that we need to understand, which I think is an open question from a scientific perspective and also in the industry, is that we need to understand the balance between humans and machines. We are in this expectation now in the machine learning AI world that we want to automate everything. But I think we have to be very careful. And I don't know if we can automate everything, or do we even want to automate everything and make sure how much it control is a human, is a, is a human in control. So, Let's resurrect the knowledge engineer. I've already seen a couple of slides with the term. Who is the knowledge engineer? It's somebody in the middle between the business user and the IT. Somebody from a hard skill perspective knows how to access data, no SQL, no scripting. And they know how business modeling. They know how to draw conceptual graphs and so forth. 
from a soft skill perspective, they're geeks with geeks and they're people person with, with, with business users. So they're really people who work with both sides of their brain. And actually, an organization, people we find, the best knowledge engineers are people who have a uh, background in computer science and have dual degrees in English and philosophy or musicians. Um, and again, this is not a term I'm inventing, right? This goes back to the early days in the 70s. Uh, I mean, the, Donald Mickey from Edinburgh, I think, is the first time I see the term knowledge engineering going around. History, sorry. So, and I'm not here alone. This is a bunch, this is a Google job post. This is, uh, I think this was Thomson Reuters. This is MasterCard. This is Amazon. This is Dun & Bradstreet. But if you look at what they're looking for, and these are kind of experts from their, from their job postings, you can see they're looking for people who can analyze graph structures, who know ontologies, who know Sparkle, who know data massaging. But they can work with linguists. They can work the, in the, they know, have knowledge of the financial industry. Uh, they can translate uh, business use requirements. They have communication skills. So this is uh, the new type of role that we're seeing. And you may be asking, is, how is this different from the data scientist? And I saw in some slides, knowledge engineer slash data scientist. They are not the same person. You always hear this complaint that 80% of the time the data scientists spend on, on organizing, cleaning the data. That is true. And this is not what the data scientists should do. And I'm not talking about cleaning the data, oh, there's a space or an apostrophe here. No, it's really understanding the semantic relationship between this concept that the business users are talking about and the, where the data is. And then once you have that understanding, go give the data to the data scientists. It's clean, beautiful data. Let them run with it. Two, methodologies. Uh, this is something that was never in my life I thought I was going to work in methodologies. I'm a, I'm a core computer scientist. I do theory. I do systems. Never I thought I was going to do methodologies. But I realized going off into the real world, trying to figure out with people and trying to address this knowledge hoarding problem is that we have to have a process to do this. So now methodology, if you go back to the 80s and why expert systems kind of failed is because there was a lack of methodologies and so a big work in the 90s. So we're building upon this work. So, to avoid boiling the ocean, what we want to do is to focus on building on, on the business questions. So traditionally, what we, what we always see is that people say, oh, we need to integrate data. Here's all my databases. Go integrate data. And we bring in an Accenture or, or, or whatever, right? And go build an enterprise data warehouse. But in reality, build, integrating your data is a means to an end because your goal is to answer business questions. So uh, Tom was presenting this morning, again, how they were focusing on business questions. So we have two, process, two steps, the knowledge capture phase. The first thing is we want to understand the business question, and we want to be able to really understand where, this, where the context of where things come from. So really go through a very basic who, what, where, when, why type of thing of understand what these questions are. And we really try to prioritize the business questions and literally start from question number one. And at this point is when you understand, oh, there is three, there's three different words that mean the same thing or we use the same word that means three different things. And we're trying, this is at the business level talking about it. We're not even looking at the data. After that, we start saying, okay, where is it in the data? Uh, we start collecting a bunch of, of, of existing uh, uh, procedures, of scripts. So I see this all the time. 10, 15 pages of one SQL query that runs a report. Do you know what goes on in that SQL query? How many people understand that? It runs. It runs in 10 minutes, and it generates the reports that people are making billion-dollar decisions on. So there's a lot of interesting knowledge that can, we can extract. So let's extract all the existing documentation out there. And then we want to be able to see where this is in the data. And we realize, look, I don't need five databases to model this question. I only need one database. I don't need 1,000 tables. I need two tables. And we start trying to organize. The, these mappings, and we've really defined almost like a spreadsheet of how to, how to represent all this information in there. Once we have that, we can go in and say, okay, now we understand this, we, can, we have basically meetings to make sure that we all are on the same page, let's go implement this. And now you can go implement your, 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 the schema in, 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 in the RDF graph world, you have OWL, there's, there's property graph schemas that we're working on, there's declarative mapping language out there for the, in the RDF world. Uh, then you want to be able to generate your data in, in a virtual way, in a, in, a, in, a, in a material way. And then you now have data to answer that question. Next question comes along. Can I answer it with the same data that I have, with the model that I have? All right, you're done. I can't. What's missing? OK, maybe this one concept, maybe this one attribute. And you extend it in an iterative way. You extend that one thing, you go look for the mapping, a very small thing, and you keep iterating 
as a, little by little, pay-as-you-go model to do this. And the great thing is that you are really compartmentalizing the concepts and where the connections to the different data sources, and you are not boiling the ocean. Three, we need better tools. And what we did at CapCenta a couple of years ago is I said, you know what? We, we, there's fantastic academic, really strong tools to create ontologies. There's nothing out there for just general purpose graphs, things I can't put in front of the business users. So we took like a half a dozen of our engineers, and for two and a half years, we spent and we designed Grapho. So you can check it out, gra.fo. Imagine it's a, it's a graph modeling tool combined with a Google Docs. It's a visual, collaborative, real-time ontology uh, knowledge graph tool. And actually, this week, we announced that we're supporting now Neo4j for their Morpheus project, for, which is a cipher of Apache Spark. We're supporting TigerGraph. We're supporting JanusGraph. Uh, we have now, we can export documentation. Uh, coming soon, we'll have an API, a bunch of other stuff. So I'd love to show you demos. I'm going to be here today and tomorrow. So Graffle. So we really want to have a tool where business users can go in, eliminate the whiteboarding aspect. So where do we put? How do we bridge this chasm? I believe that to bridge this chasm, we need the knowledge engineer. And we need to empower the knowledge engineer with tools and methodologies. So before I wrap up, this has been work for over a decade of my academic side on the business engineering side. So many people I can't thank, but now to wrap up, I started with this question 20 minutes ago. How do we bridge the conceptualization gap between the domain experts and the data? We need knowledge graphs. We need knowledge engineers. The knowledge engineers need to be empowered with methodologies. We need to focus on the business question so we do not boil the ocean. And we need to empower the knowledge engineers with tools. And we need to understand this balance between the human and the machine in the loop. With that, thank you very much. So I got three minutes for questions. I'm Thank you, too. Yeah, yeah, I see, I see. Well, how come did you switch to the dark side of the property graph force? <laughs> so this, is, this, is, this is a great question. And, and I think, so I'm, 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 of course I'm moderating the, the vendor panel tomorrow. And I, and I think. Uh, right, I, I had some, I'm asking that question because I had a question about someone telling me, well, Juan is running the, the vendor roundtable, but he's, he's not impartial there. He's cited, right? No, this is, the, here's, the, here's the thing. That, this is a great community. And the community up to now, there's been some sort of division. And this sort of division between RDF and property graph doesn't serve anybody. Amen. And I think we need to unite. Great. <laughs> so still um, one or two questions. Thanks a lot for a great presentation. So just picking up on a conversation we began at the break, uh, any quick version of, you can share with us on testing methodology, so post-design? Yes, yeah, so um, one of the things that, we want, that, we, that we're working in is, a, at least in the RDF space, there's a standard called Shackle, uh, which is a shape constraint language. It's a constraint language. Uh, so what you really want to be able to do is when you're defining your, 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 your schema, you can define these constraints, which in reality what we're seeing people are really interested on cardinalities. And then you can, when you're, when you're, you, you, when you're through your pipeline of your data, let it be an ETL or a virtual, a no ETL, you can run these checks and then you can see how things are going. In the, in the virtual aspect, what's really interesting is that I do my mapping, everything looks great. Six months later, somebody complains, data is coming out wrong. So what, did the software break? Did the mapping break? I don't think so. And what you realize is that there was a problem in the data, that, some, that there was an update on the software that feeds the data. So what, we've really, what we started to identify is a bunch of data quality issues all the way back to the systems that are writing to the original source databases. That's an example. But we can talk more about this offline. <laughs> 